Hello, I'm Ralph Gable of the Electronics for the Inquisitive Experimenter YouTube channel. FM deviation, a tough thing to measure unless you own an FM deviation meter or communication service monitor. In my experience, trying to find either of these in good working order without having to break the piggy bank is nearly impossible. The method I'm going to demonstrate here is very accurate and can be accomplished with equipment that can be used for a multitude of other purposes, not just dedicated to a single purpose. It is called the Bessel Null Method. This method can be used to measure a given deviation or set the deviation on a transmitter. It requires the modulation to be a single tone. If you have questions or comments, please feel free to add a comment to this video. If you find this video helpful, please click on the like and don't forget to subscribe. Now at the outset, I want to give you a quick peek into the background of this method. FM is relatively easy in practice, but the math behind it is mind numbing. Buried in the midst of this mathematical jungle is the Bessel function. The Bessel function takes two arguments. The first is the order of the Bessel function, or n. The second is the modulation index, or beta. The zeroth order relates to the FM carrier, and this is the one that we're interested in. The modulation index may be calculated by dividing the FM deviation by the modulation frequency. Weird, huh? Well, we can use Excel to plot the Bessel functions, and I've provided my Bessel function play Excel spreadsheet for you. See the link in the description. Now, here's what a set of Bessel functions look like. The horizontal axis is the modulation index, and the vertical axis is the value of the Bessel function. As you can see, the Bessel function periodically passes through zero for any given order. The big blue line is the zeroth order, which is the one that we're interested in. As we follow it along, we can see where it crosses zero in two places. The zeroth order Bessel function has the value of zero the first time when the modulation index equals 2.4048, round it off a little bit. And the Bessel function is periodic, like I said, so if we continue to increase the modulation index, well, it becomes zero yet again. And this occurs at a modulation index value of 5.52. Now, when the zeroth order Bessel function value equals zero, then the amplitude of the FM carrier is zero. So, the magic modulation index numbers that you want to remember for the first two Bessel nulls are 2.4048 and 5.52. We have seen that we can vary the value of a given order of a Bessel function by varying the modulation index. And because the modulation index, remember, is the deviation divided by the modulation frequency, we can vary the modulation index by varying either the FM deviation or the modulation frequency. And this is the basis of measuring or setting FM deviation using this method. Now that I've made your eyes glaze over, let's come up for air and see how to measure FM deviation with this method. Our exact setup can vary widely depending upon what the RF signal source might be. I cannot cover them all, but I will try to give you a little bit of advice here. In all cases, we have to be sure that the RF source is properly terminated in its preferred impedance. We do want to keep it happy. In the case of a transmitter, this could be a dummy load. We want to avoid doing this sort of testing over the air, if at all possible. If you absolutely must do it over the air, first of all, make sure to use absolutely the lowest possible power. Second, carefully pick an unused frequency. You don't want to mess with people. Thirdly, always identify yourself per FCC regulations 
And lastly, make it as short as possible. If you plan ahead, this won't take more than about 30 seconds to accomplish. The next thing that we have to consider is the method we're going to use to see the level of the FM carrier and only the carrier. We can do this one of two ways. We can use a narrow band CW receiver or we can use a spectrum analyzer. In this video, I'm going to show you both of those. In both cases, we have to be very careful about the amplitude of the signal that we're going to be using so we don't blow up the front end of our device. If we're working on a transmitter, we can put the dummy load in close proximity to the receive antenna of our receiver or spectrum analyzer. There is often enough signal leakage from a dummy load to give us sufficient signal to accomplish our goals. There are also various ways to pick off a little signal using a feed line sampling method. One such device is the bird inline watt meter with the sampling plug installed. The output from the sampling plug is 50 dB below the signal going through the watt meter. I emphasize, when in doubt, attenuate. Now we connect our RF source to our measurement instrument either directly, this could be through some method of attenuation, or indirectly via the air. The next thing we need is an accurate audio signal generator with a digital readout. Whatever the input of the RF source, you need to be sure that the amplitude of the audio generator is the same as the actual signal that will be doing the modulating. If it is a microphone input, you might have to attenuate the audio signal before it gets to the mic jack. Now, let me give you a tour of my setup. I'm using an RF signal generator as my FM source. And now while I could have used the internal audio source of the RF signal generator, I have chosen to use an external signal generator for the modulation source. My RF signal generator is set up for 20 megahertz with an output of minus 30 dBm. I've connected it directly to my spectrum analyzer and I've also connected the output to my homemade step attenuator and with the output of the signal generator being at minus 30 and my step attenuator set to 10 dB that means the output here is minus 40 dBm and that is connected directly across the room to my radio over there. Now let's talk about settings. The first is the audio signal generator. Remembering that the modulation index is equal to the deviation divided by the modulation frequency, we know that the modulation index will increase with decreasing modulation frequency. And because we're looking for the first zero crossing, we want to start with a low modulation index and work our way up. To do this, we start with a high audio frequency and slowly decrease this frequency to get our first null. With a modulation frequency of 3 kilohertz and using our magic 2.4048 number, this would give us a null with over 7 kilohertz of deviation, and I know that my source's deviation is well below that. So I'm going to set my audio frequency to 3000 Hertz. Next we turn our attention to the spectrum analyzer. The center frequency is 20 megahertz. The span is set to 50 kilohertz. And the RBW is set to 300 Hertz. Then there is the radio. The radio is set for a frequency of 20 megahertz. I have it in CW mode and I set my bandwidth to 250 hertz. The cool thing is this radio has a band scope and you can see the entire spectrum of that FM signal including the carrier here. The band scope will show us the spectrum. We'll be able to see the carrier nulling as we're doing things. The S meter will respond only to the carrier. But in addition to that, we have 
audio feedback. What you're hearing right now is just the carrier because of the way we have everything all set up. The quieter the radio becomes, the, the lower the carrier level is. So we'll be able to use that to help us null the carrier even more precisely. So we are all ready to go. Let's go see what our D FM deviation is. So we're ready to go here. You can hear the, the radio in the background. That tone you hear is the carrier. And we can see the carrier right here on the spectrum analyzer standing tall and proud. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to slowly decrease the audio frequency that I'm modulating with while watching the carrier and listening to the radio. We see this with the S meter on the radio or the center signal on the spectrum analyzer and the radio's band scope. Now we can hear it in the loudness of the audio tone in the speaker. So let's, let's do this. I'm going to take this, I'm going to decrease, and I'll just watch this center guy right here. And as we go down, you can see it's already starting to decrease. And we're going to end up coming to a place where we'll pass. It looks like it's just about there, but I still hear the tone in the radio. If I do one more, it comes back up, see? So that means that I kind of passed it. I'm going to decrease a little more slowly. Okay, let's go down a little bit more. Oh, and now we're going, getting quiet. I can still hear it. There, that's the best right there, I think. And that's at 1,892.7 hertz. Now, let's see what that relates to in terms of the deviation of our FM signal. Now that we know our audio frequency that caused the carrier to null, we return to our equation remembering our magic number of 2.4048. Modulation index equals the deviation divided by the modulation frequency. We rearrange that a little bit and we get the modulation index times the modulation frequency equals the deviation. So we have 2.4048, our magic number, times that audio frequency that we just found, 1,892.7 hertz. That's going to give us our deviation, and that turns out to be 4.55 kilohertz. Now that we've discovered how to measure the deviation of a given FM signal source, what about those times when we know the deviation we want, and we need to set the deviation level, such as with a repeater system? Setting an FM deviation is a non-identical twin sister to what we did to measure the FM deviation. We use exactly the same hardware setup as before. The difference is, instead of varying the modulation frequency to null the carrier, we set the modulation frequency to a specific value, and then we vary the D FM deviation to null the carrier. Suppose we're shooting for an FM deviation of 3 kilohertz. The magic number for us is 2.4048. Again, Modulation index equals deviation over modulation frequency. 2.4048 is equal to 3000 hertz, which is our intended deviation, divided by modulation frequency, the unknown. We rearrange this. We get a modulation frequency is equal to 3000 divided by 2.4048 which gives us an audio frequency of 1.2475 kilohertz. So, we set our audio signal generator for a frequency of 1.2475 kilohertz, and then we vary the FM deviation until the carrier is nulled as before. Now, as awesome as 2.4048 is, it has its limitations. 
Suppose we wanted to set the deviation of the CTCSS or PL tone of a wideband FM repeater system or radio. Suppose we want to shoot for a deviation of around 700 Hz. Using the equation as before, modulation frequency is equal to 700 Hz, our intended deviation, divided by our magic number 2.4048 gives us a modulation frequency of 291 hertz. Now, this is out of the range of the CTCSS tones as the highest tone frequency is 254.1 hertz. So, what do we do? This is where the second magic number comes to use. Let's see what happens if we use 5.52 in place of the 2.4048. The modulation frequency is equal to 700 hertz divided by 5.52, which gives us 126.8 hertz. The closest standard CTCSS tone frequency to this is 127.3 hertz, which would give us a deviation of 702.7 hertz, which is only 0.4% off of what we're shooting for. So we set the CTCSS tone to 127.3 hertz temporarily, if this is not your assigned PL tone frequency. Make absolutely sure there is no other modulation on the signal. Then set the FM deviation level of the CTCSS tone until you minimize the carrier. Once it's all set, then return your PL tone to the assigned frequency and you're all done. Well, now you know how to measure and set FM deviation using the Bessel Null Method. In the next video, I will show you how to measure the FM deviation on what I call a live signal, one that just isn't a single tone. If you found this video helpful, please click on the like and don't forget to subscribe. Thank you so much for watching. Until next time, to Lutz.